So what's it like growing up in one of America's most famous and longest running wine dynasties? What are the unique challenges in making your place in such a long line of success? And as far as the California wine industry goes, what's in store? What does the future hold? We're talking with someone who really has a firm grip and roots in its past, but also is very forward looking. Hi, I'm Natalie McLean, editor of Canada's largest wine review site at nataliemclean.com, and we gather every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, that's Toronto, New York time, to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine. Now, before I get going and introduce my guest fully, in the comments, I'd love to know where you're logging in on, uh, logging in from. I always get a kick out of where everybody's uh, from and what's going on. We've got Anne is in Halifax, Beverly is here, Lo Lois Gilbert has logged in. All right, keep it coming, guys. I'd love to know uh, where are you tonight? What's in your glass? But, uh, you know, um, I love how this brings us all together. Ah, Paul and Patty are here from uh, Virginia, and people are coming in more quickly now. All right, then. So, our guest this evening is a third generation wine grower from one of America's most historic winemaking families. At just 10 years old, she tended the gardens with her father and her grandfather and spent her high school summers working alongside her brothers and sisters in the family winery. After studying winemaking at the University of California at Davis, she became an apprentice winemaker under the careful guidance of her grandfather, Julio Gallo. And she joins me now live from her home in Napa Valley. Welcome to the Sunday Sipper Club show, Gina Gallo, hello. Hello, Natalie. I'm <laughs> happy to be here. Excellent. Excellent. So Great. good to have you. Awesome. awesome. All right. You. You've got some nice weather happening there. Okay. okay. So, so let's, let's dive, dive into, into it. it. Lots, Lots of people are joining us. Rick Delderis is here. Marco uh, uh, Gerzinic. Francis Brown, Brown is here. Neil, Neil Miller. James, James Norton. Norton. Uh, wow, you guys are coming in. Thick and strong, strong here. Great. It's, it's great, great to have you all here. Okay, okay so, so Gina, Gina, we're very, very excited. excited. Um, um, now, before we dive into the, the wine part, part uh, uh, I'd, I'd love, love to, to for all of us, us to get to know you a little, little bit more on a personal level. level. And, and one of the things I noticed that you've said previously is that one of your biggest challenges is finding balance in your life. How how do you do it? Oh. <laughs> so it's a great question, and I'll be honest, I'm still trying to do it. Um, definitely, it's a journey on that. It's a journey making wine. It's a journey finding balance. You know, when I was, um, I would say about 10 years ago, single, loving making wine, you know, footloose and fancy free. I could go anywhere um, as far as the vineyard, spend all day as well, travel, talk to people about wine. And my, my one responsibility was the ground, the land, and the wines, and myself, health and happiness. After that, being married, a lo lovely Frenchman, Jean-Charles Boisset, and then we were blessed with twins, two wow. twin girls, and they just turned seven last weekend. Oh, my goodness. That's when I realized <laughs> juggling a career, family, a wonderful husband, um, children, their needs, the household in balance. So I think that really stepped it up for me. Yeah. Um, one thing is prioritizing. Um, the other thing is my grandfather and my father, my mother and father really, if the, health, if the family's healthy, the rest of the world will fall into place. You know, you cannot dive too deep into work. Really the most important is your house, your home. Um, so with that is always taking that as my first step forward and being in check, communication, being with our little twins, daughters, also with my husband and his career, and taking that as a priority, then everything else, my career that I love, the wine that I love creating, that is secondary, most importantly, but when I find it secondary, I can be able to put the most energy into it, because everything else is feeling good. Wow. Is it perfect? Fantastic. Absolutely not. Like <laughs> I say, it's a journey, and I'm still learning. Um, and then the one thing that I forgot is really important, and we always tend to put ourselves last, mm -hmm. is yourself. Mm -hmm. Health mindful soul, mind, body, and soul, you know, is getting out at least um, sometime during the day, even if it's for five minutes, some type of workout or some type of, I wouldn't say pampering, but something about yourself. And I think that helps clear your mind and have a good mind as far as everything else. And it really does put it in perspective. Wow. And That's lastly, crazy. but not lastly, spirituality, right? 
We all have to have that. We can never do it alone. We have our family, we have our friends, but then there is a higher power that's out there. And I truly believe in that, in the spirit. And uh, having a bit of, whether it be meditation or whether it be a certain religion, is having that deep inside your soul to help keep you balanced and uh, integrated um, and centered, most importantly. That is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. fantastic. Wow, wow, what a way, way to, to start, start an interview. Okay, okay I'm, gonna I'm gonna welcome, gonna welcome lots, lots of people who are coming, coming in. in. There's, There's Jillian Dodd-Taylor, Taylor, uh, uh, Diane, Diane Russell-Kisser, Russell Sterling Foster is here, Lauren Mackin, Lori Kilmartin, Ebony Latrice, Hey, guys. Wow. Okay. Um, you guys are coming in. All right. And so I know you guys are going to enjoy this conversation already. We're off to a great start. So take a moment to share this video with uh, your friends who love wine as much as you do. Even better, comment on uh, the fact we're here live with Gina, what you're enjoying. As you know, every week at the end of our session, I pick a winner a contest winner based on who shared and commented from the previous week. So I'll be announcing that at the end of today's session. It's going to be that book, Tasting the Past, by the Associated Press correspondent, Kevin Bagels. If you share tonight's and comment, uh, we have a very special bottle of wine for you. Um, this is the Pinot Noir, the Gallo Pinot Noir uh, that is here among my bottles. It's not even available in Canada. It's $60. I bet you you'd have it, Gina. Let me just put you up here. Put it close, close to the, to the uh, camera, camera, Gina. Gina. There, there we go. go. That's, That's it. it. So, so it's, it's a pretty, pretty special, special bottle. bottle. Um, um, glorious. I just opened it. It is magnificent. magnificent. So, so guys, get sharing. sharing. All, All right. right. So, so let's, let's get back. Now, you mentioned, Gina, Gina really interesting. A few more personal questions here, if you don't mind. Um, uh, health, health is so, so important. important. Um, you've, you've also, also mentioned, mentioned in previous speeches that you are a breast cancer survivor. survivor. Congratulations, Congratulations on that. that. And Thank tell, you. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Wow. wow. That so, happens a lot in my family as well. What and was, anyone that's online, congratulations and hang in there. Yeah, absolutely. What was, what was, um, how, what was the most important thing to you when you were battling, uh, the disease? Well, you, you know, you asked about balance of life, yeah. and um, it's interesting. I was running like crazy, going where people wanted me to go. Um, probably my biggest fault. We'll probably talk about faults, but I'll, that would be one of my faults. But loving my career, loving my life, and not realizing that I wasn't taking time for myself. Mm -hmm. So when that hit me, and um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and it was triple negative, um, they, I caught it early enough, which was good, but triple negative is obviously not as good because there's nothing you could take. You basically get the hardest treatment, whether the chemo, the um, radiation, and then you move on and you start living your life. But with that, I think when you live your life is you start reevaluating your life. So going through that, I was very fortunate. Jean Charles, my husband and I, we had just not met six months prior. I felt like I needed to go through it alone. Tried to push him away and wanted to do it alone, but really, did I want to? Probably not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was amazing. He said, you know, Gina, this is the first bump in the road. It probably won't be our last, but this isn't making me leave. And he was there wow. through every appointment. He was my champion. He was my, the one that pushed me after chemo saying, okay, get out and walk around that vineyard. Go, um, you know, get some fresh air. And so that tremendous help. I really, my hat goes off to those that go through it alone. He really um, was my true supporter. And then at that same time, really saying, okay, why did this happen to me? Very healthy, always ate great, um, very balanced, I thought. <laughs> but then once I realized I wasn't, because I wasn't taking time for myself. So I started pulling back a little bit and taking more time for myself. I did something that I loved um, when I was going through the treatment. I've never taken, well, I took piano when I was little, but I should have focused more when I was little, as well as cooking. I had this wonderful um, uh, chef. Uh, her name is Rebecca Katz, and she actually put out a book on cancer survivors and how to cook and how to nourish your body to heal your body. I don't even think it's just for cancer patients. It is for anyone. Her recipes are fabulous, and I was fortunate to have her come to the house um, every other week, and we would cook. And, you know, I learned a lot from my grandparents, my grandmother, my mother cooking, but very basic. And so to really dive deep, as we say, when we really love something, I had the opportunity to dive deep with her. All the amazing things like turmeric, an amazing spice that is something that we could use on a daily basis that helps us with our circulation. Um, different herbs, different spices. 
different vegetables, why they're powerful for our body. So that, I think, really brought me um, back to the ground again, back to the garden, but back to a bit of, I wouldn't say selfishness, but um, self-care. Really self-care. self-care and yeah. balance. So yeah. that was that helped me tremendously. And coming back to balance, it's a balance of life. But mm-hmm. yes, um, it was a shocker. And I mm-hmm. think God works in mysterious ways. And he needed, he needed to give me a wake-up call. Wow. And that definitely was my wake-up call in my uh, mid-30s. My goodness. Very wow. young, which is yeah. very not normal, but we're finding it more and more in America, especially with triple negative, young individuals um, are getting this. And, you know, it's environmental. It's definitely environmental, but it's also stress. Mm-hmm. Because in our family, no one has ever had cancer. Wow. So yeah. yeah. They say it's genetics, yeah. but... Mm-hmm. But For us, yeah, it was not genetic. It's got to so. be the environment, yeah, yeah when it didn't, didn't run in your family. family. My, goodness, My goodness, so, so much, much in there that you just mentioned in, in the, the, the tight, tight ties with family and, and doing things together. And that's actually, actually a good segue, segue now. now. Uh, you, you learned from, from your grandfather, grandfather Julio, Julio Gallo. Gallo. Maybe, Maybe you could share with us, we've talked about this previously, but share with us kind of what were the important lessons he taught you in winemaking. Well, my grandfather was amazing. It was interesting. Um, no one really went into winemaking in our family because I think all of us believed Grandpa would be here forever. He was the winemaker. He had an amazing team of winemakers. They were all men because <laughs> we have to go back a few years. And it was definitely a male-dominated world in, in the career I'm in, winemaking, as well as the wine business in general. Um, but I stumbled across my career very um, – well, we won't get into that, but what he taught me was um, two great things that I take with me now, and that is you always tell the quality of the vineyard by the footprint of the owner in that vineyard, and it's a very simple quote that he lived by, but I take it to heart and believe in it, and it's very true. You know, it's about you getting your hands dirty, you being in the vineyard, you understanding the soil, you understanding the vines and feeling those vines, then you could turn them into something amazing and special. The other thing that I really realized when I was in his tasting group with the uh, the other gentleman was I could tell um, when people felt they knew it all, he really had a hard time with those individuals. So he taught me, you know, Gina, when you, when you um, stop asking questions, hand over that baton. And that I take to heart today, too, because the inquiring mind is a growing mind. And it always opens your mind to different things, more powerful things, more intriguing things. And it might not be the answer you wanted for that particular question that you were asking, but it opens your mind for something else. Or maybe it does ask answer the question for what you ask. So I think that's always very good. It's just um, never be afraid. And as we always say, there is never a wrong question. There's never a silly question. Every question is very important. And when it's asked to an individual that might have a greater knowledge, it opens their mind to something they might not have thought about. So those are the two, I would say, fab- really yeah. Uh, things that I keep with me on my wine journey. That's absolutely, absolutely fantastic. fantastic. And let, let me, me look, look at, at Facebook. Facebook. I'm just getting so wrapped, wrapped up here. Uh, uh, folks, uh, Stephen uh, Andrews, Andrews, welcome. And, and Beverly Aslan, uh, your favorite wine. wine. Claire, Claire Papineau, Papineau. Hello, hello from Ottawa. Ottawa. Sam Hawk is out in BC. Vince Satkoff has joined us. Not sure where you're logging in from, Vince, but tell us. Um, and you're here in Halifax. Anne says, Anne says you're very courageous, courageous Gina. Thank, thank you for sharing that story. story. Amazing. Oh. And um, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Paul we Hollander. Each other. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, Paul Hollander recently enjoyed a 2010 signature series Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. It blew our socks off. It was so good. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That was my most challenging wine, was but it? absolutely loved it. I think Pinot Noir in general, because my grandfather, you know, when you go back, uh, he, we, our winery started in 1933. So in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even 70s, Pinot Noir in America, California, was light, almost VA vinegar, not very high quality. Very few producers were really starting then. Davis Bynum was one. Um Whichever, what else would I say? There was, a, there was three that really, really drove it. Louis M. Martini, actually, as well, and in uh, Russian River Valley. Um, I have another on the tip of my tongue, but I can't think of it. But that being said, so we didn't have a lot of experience with Pinot. And when I come to find out, I tasted an amazing Burgundy, a fabulous, top-of-the-top Grand Cru, had an opportunity, tasted this, and said, why can't we do this in California? We should be able to do it. But in the family, it was like, oh, Pinot, no. Zin, yes. Cab, yes. All these others, yes. 
And so that put me on a journey to understand Pinot better. The clones are tremendously important for Pinot Noir. It's all about the clones, which is interesting because, and that's what I love about it too. It's very much like cooking. Each clone, whether you're using a Dijon clone, 667, 777, or Permard, um, some of the ones we have in Oregon or here, um, they all add a different element to our signature series. So it's like when you're adding spices and different things to your dish, it's adding different elements. Unlike Cabernet from a certain plot is that Cabernet. Pinot Noir with different clones from the same plot, very unique, different clonal um, expressions. So you really get to play with art and you get to mix and blend and create the Pinot you believe that people are really going to love and turn them on to Pinot. Wow, play, oh, play with, with art. art. I, I love, love that. that. I love how you're bringing, bringing it all together. together. And, and I, I have, have several Pinots here. I'm going to still ask you other, other questions, questions aside, aside from, from the wine-specific wine ones. ones. But, but um, the, I, was I was wondering, wondering uh, among, among the wines, wines that you that have, have there, there, the Pinots, Pinots which one would you like yes. to start with? Would it well, I, I would start with the J. So we have the okay. J Vineyard. Yeah. So that would be this one. And this is 2015 Russian sure. River. Okay. okay. Yay, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got it. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca. All right. So, so what makes this, this vineyard, vineyard special? special? So this, Judy Jordan started this winery, the J Winery. Okay. And our family was fortunate to acquire it in partnerships with her, and now we have it. We've acquired it. Mm -hmm. um, and she just did a lot of great homework on delicacy with Pinot. Certain areas, she has some beautiful different blocks within the Russian River Valley. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness. That's, That's elegant. elegant. Oh. You Ooh. get the cherry, mm. a little bit of spice, mm -hmm. but its signature is the silky tannins. It yeah. just, and also the savory character. With creating wine for myself, I think that savoriness is very important. It makes your mouth water. You want to go yes. back and have another sip. Absolutely. No, that's fantastic. So okay. that is, the, that's the J. Yeah. Um, do you want to compare it with the signature? Because very sure. two different, yes. unique. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. I've got the signature right here, I believe. Ooh. That's the signature. Yep. Yep. The okay. signature. Good, and good. here we have the 2014. Okay. And it's from San Lucia. Okay. So here we just moved from the Russian River and we headed down south, Santa okay. Lucia. Okay. Beautiful area. Mm -hmm. This is where it comes back when I was talking to clones. So this particular vineyard we have uh, 23, 777, and also 828. So blending these three different um, these three different clones. This area, because of its influence by the ocean and the wind, um, tends to be extremely. You get a bit thicker skinned and bigger, more voluptuous. Absolutely. Um, a you bit can more really powerful. Taste, taste the difference. The difference. Like, like this, this is more velvet. velvet. The, the last, last one was silk. silk. This is velvet. velvet. Still, Still plush and smooth, smooth but you've, you've got, got even more richness, richness and voluptuousness, voluptuousness on the palate. Mm. That's, That's a so great good. way to describe it. Velvet okay. versus thick. The okay. silkiness. Yeah. The the silk. on the yeah. J and the velvet here. It's a little bit, yeah. a little bit fuller and more voluptuous. Absolutely. This is a really cool vineyard. Um, the Olson was the original family that purchased, that owned it. Okay. And before that, they were the original owners, and it was virgin land, so never planted to vineyards. But we had some wonderful neighbors that were surrounding the area. We did the soil samples and all the proper homework, but our gut feeling was we knew this Santa Lucia, the Olson Vineyard, would have a tremendous potential for some of the top Pinots that are out there. And which is really nice about it is when we put it in, we knew it would have Pinot. We put a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc and also Chardonnay oh, really? and had a really opportunity to start from the ground up with different clones. So this particular vineyard has 10 different clones within it, which is lovely. And we put 10, not 10,000, excuse me, 2,000 different oak trees within the vineyard. So it's very diverse in its cultural habitat. So it's just not all vines. It used to have some beautiful big oaks. It still has a lot of those beautiful big oaks. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to, on a sustainable basis, and that's what sustainability is all about, is bringing back even more of the oaks. Mm -hmm. So we replanted a lot of the oaks. And then a portion of this is in the um, land grant, which is all left to natural habitat. So it's just wild because you have some wonderful predators in the wild that will help the healthier vines. So you have that nice balance where it's just not a landscape of vineyard, but it's right. a landscape that is a, painted like a picture. Like right. behind you. Yes. That almost think, looks like Olsen. Oh, my goodness. I See? think it is. That, whoever's watching, that is yes. literally Olsen. You have the... Um, it's Olsen. You have, yes, you have the oak trees. 
beautiful big first growth oaks and then you have some smaller ones in the back yeah. that are starting to come up and then the natural habitat up on the hillside too. That's so amazing. It's, it's all coming together. together. Yeah, yeah, I, I bought, bought that while I was in Napa Valley, Valley, a painting, and, and it's by Patrick O'Rourke. And I contacted him just recently to ask his permission that I could have it in my background. He gave it to me. I love, I feel like I'm in the middle of the vineyards here. <laughs> but um, one thing you were saying, Gina, that was really interesting, the land grant. Is that um, a certain percentage of the land you leave uh, fallow or, or with other sort of habitats? Oh, I think we may have lost her temporarily if we have. Um, she knows that she can log back in um, using the same link. So I will email her and let her know that, but I, I do think she knows. So we'll just wait for her to rejoin us. And in the meantime, <laughs> I think I had her on freeze frame there. Um, okay, good to hear, Sam says in BC, good to hear what Gina is doing. Let me just email her and let her know, because these things happen when you're live, right? Uh, use the same link to log in. There we go. And hopefully she'll be able to do that. Oh, there she is. The doorbell rang. Here we are. Okay. And you're back. No, that's okay. That's okay. That happens, uh, you know, with the technology. Um, let me make sure that you're still... I've got you on freeze frame here. So I'm going to just go in here and add you again so i believe we can hear you but let me see that's what happens with live <laughs> okay let me just bring you in on this shot thanks for your patience folks please keep adding comments in the facebook below here now i think we have her back here Yes, yes, there, there you, are. you are. You're off, off to one, one side, side because I haven't framed you up. <laughs> Do you, you want, want to move that way? way? <laughs> Let's, Let's see. see. I'll see, see what happens when, when... Oh, we've got you in triplicate there. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> 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 to, deal with the, uh, to deal with the twins and everybody. Okay, okay let me see, see if I can. Oh, oh there. Oh, I've got that one. Okay. Let's, Let's see, see now, now if I can get rid of that one. And... Get the one where you are live. Let's try this again. One sec, folks. We should be back momentarily. There you are. Okay, I think I've got the one where you're actually moving, Gina, which helps. <laughs> there you are. You're back. You're back. Thank you for your patience. Um, okay, so um, we were just tasting those magnificent Pinot Noirs. We were talking about the backdrop, um, and I just explained to folks who the artist was. So, um, Let's dip, dip back, back into, into uh, you, and, and what was, what was the, the moment? moment? Now, you grew up in a winemaking family, family, but do you recall the, the, the moment, moment you said, said yes, yes, I want to make wine. wine. Like, like, this is what, what I want to do. Was, was there something, something that, that triggered, triggered that, that thought? thought? I was following what I saw by example by my mother and father. They loved what they did. And my father, I remember telling me, you know, Gina, find your passion not your pension and it will come and so i remember in college marketing and i tried you know sales i love psychology but then i remember talking to a mentor and i wish i could remember who it was but they're like you don't want to listen to people's problems every day but i did love psychology and that was i think bad probably not the best advice but it, it was good advice for the fact that i was still searching on what i wanted to do so my first degree was in um, business and psychology Okay. And after that, I knew I wanted to be a part of a family winery, so I started out in sales. Sales is an amazing way to learn not only your family wines, but all the other wines that are out there in the world, as well as customers and restaurateurs and retailers. And so I started there. It was only about six months into my first sales job that I had that I asked my district manager, I really want to understand more the dynamics and the science behind wine. I understood wine making, but not the science. I understood farming even better than the wine making process. So he said, you can go to UC Davis, take the extension courses, as long as you can keep your sales route, no problem. So this was the spark for me. So it was after my first degree, my formal degree in college, I went to UC Davis. I had Dr. Ann Noble, for oh, sensory, wow. sensory science she and wine. She created the aroma wheel, as we all know. The aroma wheel, yeah. which wow. I found fascinating. And um, because at our family, 
table. Wine was at the table. Food was at the table. But the most important thing was family gathering around the table and friends. And then really secondary was the second was the food hot, beautifully done. And the last was wine because it was already in the bottle. So you open it up and you enjoy the wine. But we weren't sitting around a table dissecting it and smelling it. So for me, it was about being with the food. So Anne, Dr. Ann Noble really opened my eyes to, well, there's a lot going on here. This is a Cabernet, but I taste blackberries. I taste currant. I taste some of the, you know, forest floor. What's happening? This is a grape. And I never really thought of it, about it that way. So I love that aspect of it. And then the other was Dr. Linda Basson, mm -hmm. which was the science behind wine, which, which I, I loved, loved because I had no, no experience with the science or the wine making process as far as what was happening behind the scenes when it was fermenting and all that great stuff. And I have a twin. twin I, I think, think that's, that's coming up right now. But sorry <laughs> that's fine. That life, life, life happens loves. when it's live. That's, that's okay. okay. <laughs> So I would say that was the magical mark, was that those two amazing professors, and we probably all, who everyone's listening out there, there was that one teacher that sparked you in an interesting way. So I found myself with them still doing my sales. I love sales because I like building the business of whether it be the restaurateur or the restaurant or the uh, retail, because it was a win-win. You're trying to give them the wines that are really going to move in their store. But with the um, when I was learning about winemaking, they sparked me because I found myself after school going home and reading and reading. When I wasn't selling, I was reading. And honestly, I loved college where I went to school, but it was more about the social and the, the your friends. And I sure, I did my homework and I did decent, you know, very good grades. But I never found myself very studious and wanting to read. So that, again, said, this must be me. I had the bug. I had the bug, and it was in my blood, definitely. But um, I knew this was going to be my path. And from then on, um, I've continued uh, on that path. It's fantastic. And, and that, that kind, kind of division, division of labor, labor between, between the, person the person who wants to be in the vineyard and the person who loves sales, sales and marketing, marketing, that happened between your your grandfather and your great uncle, I assume, his brother, Ernst, Ernst and, Ga and Julio, right? One yes, my great uncle Ernest. He was definitely he was amazing in the um, the marketing, the sales. He loved to travel. He loved to talk, to talk to people. He loved to understand what was going on, um, what they were looking for, or wanted. And you have to realize, if you go back, our family winery was started right after Prohibition, 1933. So when wow. he went out and really started selling wine, the American population wasn't even enjoying wine. You know, some of the uh, immigrants definitely were. But in general, he comes back on a train from the East Coast to my grandfather, Julio, and says, Julio, you know, this is going to be about not just us making great wine, but how are we going to explain this and share it and let people know this is great to have a bottle of wine on every table and enjoy with family and friends. So that was his task at the very beginning. And then my grandfather, Julio, he just had an amazing knack for um, environment, for the culture of the ground, for the dirt, for the soil. He, unfortunately, and neither did my grand uh, great uncle Ernest, they didn't have the opportunity to go away to college they had their degree as far as high school but not college so they learned everything my, my grandfather learned, learned everything through his own garden mm -hmm. and literally the library he went and got a book on winemaking and read and he he was a student he studied himself as far as learning on uh, winemaking but his garden he learned tremendously because he loved food being italian food was very important his fruit trees his tomatoes you know Every um, yeah, vegetable, vegetable that he planted, it was all organic. He was very focused on it. And he learned a lot through that garden and through the fruit trees and learning how to grow amazing grapes and where to plant those amazing grapes, hmm. i.e. Sonoma, which, which is amazing, amazing, and as well as Napa. So there's been some wonderful things there wow. that he wow. learned. That's I don't want to talk too much. Sorry, I can no, go no, on forever. That's okay. I miss them terribly. I'll tell you that. Aww. I miss them terribly. <laughs> We've got They're some great, great inspiration. Absolutely. Absolutely, folks. This is so, so good. good. You, If you're enjoying this, I know you are. Please take a moment to share it. Um, and even better, comment. Tell your friends who love wine why you're enjoying this conversation. As you know, those who do will have an opportunity to win a bottle of wine, very premium wine, uh, that I'll announce next week. But if you shared last week's video, then of course I'll be announcing that winner at the end of tonight's conversation. All right, and I just want to take a peek over at Facebook. Um, Beverly says, I love, says, I love her enthusiasm, enthusiasm of wine and the family, family history. history. Doug, Doug Steger just joined us. us. Charlotte, Charlotte Cadieux has joined us. Dave Head has joined us. Dave Dave has joined us. Joined us. 
um, Alan Cameron says she's good. <laughs> she, they're loving your stories. <laughs> I love live. Uh, Lori Kilmartin says she's a lady after my own heart. Dean Johnson has joined us. Tim Belt says it's working now. Oh, the tech stuff. Thank you, Tim. Um, and Lori Sweet, uh, when you speak, there's an echo. So let me know if the, you're still getting that echo, Lori. Hopefully that's gone. Melanie Lloyd, we can hear her now. Yay. Okay. They're all my tech support out there. James Norton, yay. Okay. Um, great. So, Gina, tell us a bit about... Um, if you could pick one moment in your winemaking career so far, you've got lots ahead of you, but what has kind of been your, what do you consider your greatest um, success or the moment that's been pivotal for you so far? Oh, that's, I mean, greatest success. I would, <clears throat> the biggest was finding the passion within the winemaking. You know, I would, I, I, I think my greatest I don't know, success, not success, but I would say, you know, winemaking, and this is why I think it's wonderful for uh, women. It's very much now, now I, I see, see with raising my two, our twin daughters. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the patience of the waiting. And, you know, when you think about it, for my career, maybe if I'm really lucky, I'll have 50, probably not 40, what, harvests in my lifetime. And that would be really lucky. So that's 40 times. When you look at a chef, it can go back that day, the next hour. It can go back the next day. It can really go back and create. So as far as wine making, I think the most challenging thing is it happens through the whole season, one, the whole year, and you have that one opportune time. So with that, I would say really keeping really wonderful notes and always learning from one vintage to pass on to the next vintage. So, so I think I this is success would be because my nickname when I was little was short fuse or firecracker. So patience <laughs> probably, probably was not in my <laughs> forte or in my blood. And I think for me, the success is that I've learned to be patient, hmm. learn to be nurturing, learn to take your time and to slow down. It doesn't happen now. It really takes time. So successfully for me, emotionally growing is the patience. Wow. As far as creating, I would say it bridges off my father. My father was great with um, his influence in um, mentoring, mentoring and with our whole winemaking team because he was very different than my grandfather. My grandfather, as I mentioned, he was the winemaker. He first, he basically was, you know, directing on what to do. He listened to the winemaking team, but it really was he was in charge and the winemaker. For my father, um, after my grandfather unfortunately passed. When he stepped and in and took over the reins, he was definitely about, well, what would you do? Think on your own. Are you going to do this? Would you? And it was very shocking to some of the veteran winemakers. For me, it was really refreshing and interesting. And it really got you thinking on your own feet. And also, he was the biggest inspiration for me to um, experiment. It's okay if you fail. You might fail once, but that failure will lead you, you if, it's, if it's, not, it's not for Pinot Noir, maybe it's something great for a Cabernet. So you're going to learn through those failures. I wouldn't be able to fail too many times, but at the same time, I think he's been inspiration to experiment. So I think that he gave me the confidence to experiment and have the guts to do it. And I think as far as success, That's, some of the great wines I've made today is because I had the guts to believe that it could work and it could happen. So to have that confidence within creating. Wow. That's, That's fantastic. fantastic. And is, is there, there anything, anything that you've, you've encountered, encountered in your career, career so far that you consider kind of your worst moment, moment but it was, it was something, something that really taught you or made you better in some way? I mean, we've, we've kind of talked, talked a lot of those stories, but is there anything else, else you want to mention, mention that was kind of like a, a low moment career-wise, but how did you rebound? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> low moment career. Um, I think my low moment, again, it goes back to, managing, managing, um, and prioritizing. And this would go back to one of my faults. I think, um, it's a strength, but it's definitely a weakness. Whoever's yelling the loudest, I will go to, I will help. I will do. So wherever it was in sales or in the market or in the winery, instead of pulling back and realizing where should I be going? What, where could I be the most impactful? So, um, getting rid of the noise, always listening to individuals, but I would say that hurt me in my waymaking career because I was running so much out in the market, out in sales, mm -hmm. that back in the winery, I had a wonderful team that I'm not a micromanager, so they didn't need it. But I wasn't as connected with them because I was out in the market when I was truly a winemaker and truly I'm probably more an introvert than an extrovert, mm -hmm. more of a trained extrovert. 
So I think that held me back with our team in our winery. And, and it was a great learning curve for me to keep that balance, again, for the market out there, as well as back at home, creating and making the wine and our wonderful team of winemakers that we have. I don't know if that makes sense. But yeah, it, it does. For Lots me, it of was wisdom. definitely, it was an eye opener and it was a low because I feel like I should have saw it and I didn't. And now I do. So I feel more balanced in that area. Fantastic. Wow. And I can say no, which is a big one, right? That's not easy. <laughs> that is hard. Sometimes you have to say no and let it go. Ah, oh, yes. <sighs> Lori, Lori Deming, Deming says, says such, such a lovely, lovely oh, such, such lovely vineyard shots. shots. I'm, I'm cutting, cutting away, away to shots, shots that uh, Rebecca, Rebecca sent me of uh, your, your winery and your grandfather, grandfather and your great uncle, uh, uh, grand uncle. Um, um, now we had, had a comment back here. Ah, Paula Oreskovich, you probably recognize that name. She says, I love Gina Gallis. So proud of all that she does for the California wine industry. Can't wait to see what the future holds for her and the Gallo team. That's so nice. Lori is Thank from, you. Yeah, from, from uh, Cole Harbor. And all oh, right, guys, I can't keep up with you. <laughs> okay, so. Um, I know, I'm trying to share. <laughs> yeah, multitasking. I, I can't even share it doesn't this with work. My Facebook friends. I think I should. <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. That's Natalie, you're amazing. You're oh, great. This thank is you. Oh, thank you. Ah, it's a lot it's of fun. Really cool. I, I love the technology because, you know, when it comes together, and, you know, you get the live aspect of it. That's the power of it, as opposed to us just pre-recording a video, right? And even the fact, you know, the line drop, that's okay. That's what happens in a live performance. That's why people show up. It's like, hmm, wonder what will happen. Will it work? Won't it? <laughs> you know, Well, and the that. fact I was scared to death 45 minutes, I'm thinking, oh, my God, no, <laughs> I no. I don't. So hopefully ask questions just, out there. I'd love absolutely. to hear questions. Absolutely. We would love to Yes. Ask. Sandy Buchanan has joined us. And, yes, Gina... Uh, is, is it's thirsty, thirsty for your, your questions, questions and, and I'll, I'll try, try to keep looking over at Facebook. Facebook. I get so caught up in her answers here. I'm, I'm not paying not attention enough to you guys. guys. Wow, not what a family history, says Patty. Okay. okay. So, so what about, maybe Gina, you could share with us the biggest misconception, if there is one, about Gallo wines. What do you think people don't understand about your wines? I, I would say definitely, as I was mentioning, uh, my grandfather, Julio, my great uncle, Ernest, the reason they, they gave us such an amazing foundation is because of their, you know, um, their love in different areas. And with immigrants, usually they typically were more farmers than market and want to go out in the sales. So that so gave us an amazing foundation. With that, bringing wine to the table, they always believed in having value in that wine. They wanted, whether it be the Hardy Burg in the early days, the Chablis in the early days, some of those, you know, blended wines, the jug wines, you know, at that time, that is really what people enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And with that, adding value. So I still have people today who say, oh, my God, I, I love the Hardy Burgundy. you know, even like serious <laughs> writers. And I'm like, well, you know, it was really good juice. It was Napa, 75%, and Sonoma, the balance. So it really was great juice but it is a little bit sweeter. But I think because of that, in that strong brand of our family name, a lot of the misconception, wouldn't, they wouldn't realize how sustainable we are, how much we're committed to the land, how much we're committed to the family and our family winery and the family employees that we have with us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we got stuck in a little area where we are more for simple wines, basic wines. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, boom, I would say in ba basically in the late 80s, 90s, we had the iconic cabs. Well, that's, well, that's when we were coming out with our estate cab. But with that, I don't think people realize that Gallo was making some serious wines that were going to be iconic out there and competing yeah, against the best wines in the world. So I would say that would be a misconceived uh, conception because I think we have some lovely wines out there. But people might think we're more of a table wine, everyday wine, very affordable wine. Mm -hmm. Even when you buy our estate cab, it's still going to be at a beautiful price. Mm -hmm. hundred, it'll be under a hundred dollars, but it will compete against some of the right. Bordeaux's that are at a thousand dollars. Right, very comparable. Yeah. So I think also, you know, and I'm I'm guilty of it too. I think if it's more of a higher price, it's going to be better. Mm -hmm. You know, um, with all that. But there's certain areas of things that we purchase that we should realize price isn't everything. And there are families and other wine uh, winery families that are out there making wonderful wines that they believe like we believe that there's a certain amount of value that should be instilled in that wine. And when that person opens up that bottle, they're going to be, wow, this is pretty cool. This is amazing. You know, and we know how much it costs to grow those grapes, to make that wine. And we know exactly how much that should be passed on 
to the consumer to be able to put back the goods back into the land. Mm -hmm. You don't need more than that. You just need to keep it alive and keep it flourishing. Absolutely. So that would be the biggest, I would say, quickly I, off the top of my, I didn't, yeah. yeah that would no, be a quick Absolutely, question. that's a great answer. And I think with family-owned wineries, there, there, there is, is that, that, not, not just, just that, that pride, pride in the history of winemaking, but the ability to make decisions that just aren't, you know, you know quarterly, quarterly quarterly results, results driven, driven like, like to shareholders who are pressuring, pressuring you, know, you know, so that the land grant and the, you know, you know the conservation, conservation efforts, efforts, you know, those are, are there. They're, they're not all bottom, bottom line, line, they're, they're um, what do you call them, top, top line, line or whatever. They're, they're long-term long thinking because it's a family business. No, and Andrew, you hit it on a perfect, especially the agricultural world, any agricultural world, which the wine world is agricultural based, yeah. family owned uh, wineries, um, or whether it be other agricultural based family owned, it, it's, it's, um, it, it is the way it is because it's generational. The way we are creating our wines, the way we're developing and managing and taking care and tending to the farms and the land yeah. is for not myself, but it's our children, yes. you know, the little girls that are only seven. But when you, when it is on, um, you know, stock market, they do have to record. And there's some great wineries out there that are, Absolutely, but it's more challenging for them because they cannot. It's hard for them to think long term and feel long term. Yeah. But um, that's a big bonus that we do have. Staying family owned, we hopefully always will. We're third generation, and that's that's going to be our biggest challenge moving forward. Is how do we keep that uh, keep it within the family and keep all the family members engaged and connected because the family's growing. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and you know, know that, that the, the striking, striking similarity, similarity I see, I see here in what, what you're saying, saying is. is um, also, also with, with port, port producers, producers from, from Portugal, Portugal. All, all of the, the many, many of those are still, still you know, you know, in families, families. And, and they, they have, have to, to. The, the, the amount, amount of aging, aging that goes on and the reserves and everything else, else they, they, they they just they're not, not quarterly driven, driven at all. They're not, not even annually, annually driven. driven. They're, they're like decades, decades driven. driven. And, and that's the exactly. only way yeah, the only way can, <laughs> you can do it. Um, we do have questions coming in. Um, okay, so let me get back here because you guys are asking some great questions. Um, Tim Belch asks, has she ever used a wine consultant as portrayed in the documentary Vino Montalcino? Mo or is that Mondo Vino? I don't know. Maybe I'm getting the wrong documentary mixed up. But have you ever had consulting winemakers or anything like that? We have, we have. We've worked with two. We worked with a wonderful gentleman in Oregon and also in um, the Russian River Valley, um, Paul Hobbs. Oh, yes. Um, which is right. lovely, lovely gentleman. Great wines, fabulous wines. I think it's really important to, it, that goes back to the communication and understanding and working with them and sharing information for winemakers to winemakers. I think, I feel is very important because the better wine we all make, the better the wine world will be in the future mm -hmm. and grow. And we're putting the grapes at the right place in the right area. Mm -hmm. um, and it was tremendous. It was really interesting. It was very helpful seeing it through their eyes of how they look through wine and how they're creating wine. And it's, it's almost like experimentation where you have an opportunity, you're experimenting with this individual because they're giving you these things in your head and you're living it through them. So you, you can take or you choose or you don't, but it opens your mind. What you hear from them will definitely open your mind to something else and greater because we just keep learning on this. But yes, I definitely believe in consultants. I think there's some great ones out there. Um, and we all have something to learn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's good, good cross-pollination -pollina of, of, of knowledge. knowledge. <laughs> yes. Um, Paul and the key with that is they're never going to have your plot of vineyard. So it's not going to make wine homogeneous, which people right. think. Right. This one that the gentleman's mentioning, yeah. they mm -hmm. do, he, it has a bit of a reputation of being really oaky and all of this. So it's not showing the true terroir. But in general, that should never happen because okay. it should be about your land and the purity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Paula Oreskovich asks, what is the biggest issue facing the California wine industry in the future? Ooh, big question. All right. Question. The California wine industry in the future, I think it's going to be our how we're getting the wine to market is a big one right now. You know, we're very used to working in the three-tier system through distributors, um, through importers. Um, there's definitely some direct to sale. But now you have individuals, you have an Amazon that's coming in, which oh. I think is going to be amazing, but it's going to be a challenge for the uh, distribution system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think technology is playing a huge role. I think it's going to be fabulous for the customer in the end because it's going to it, it's going to help get these wonderful wines to market maybe sooner. 
But I think it's going to have to equalize out of how much of it plays a role and how much the uh, three-tier system plays because, you know, there, there's a lot of pluses about the three-tier system. I can't be in every market. You know, we have Rebecca who's hopefully listening. <laughs> She's in the market. She is there. She is a wonderful face. She can share our family wines. Same with the distributors and the salespeople that work hard for um, these distributors. They can explain these wines and talk to them. So Amazon, you're buying online. It's not going to really be able to explain too much to you, but it's going to be nice because you'll be able to get these wines in different venues. Yeah. So I think they're all going to work, but it's going to be challenging of how um, it all balances itself out, I would say, sure. is a big one. Absolutely. Um, the other is... We've had a great couple of years. The industry has been growing really, really strongly. Um, and Canada has always been strong. I mean, it's been up and up and up. I think the U.S. market for Canada is almost almost 30. I think it's 27%. Wow. So the love for the American wine in Canada, we really appreciate all the Canadians that are listening. Um, really, especially the Cabernets. And they love the diversity of the Chardonnays. They seem oh. very diverse and they appreciate yes. that. Right. Um, but with that, I think we're going to hit a little bit of a, not a saturation, but slowing down. Okay. And what does that mean for us? How do we adjust? How do we, um, how do we make sure we don't have too much um, wine out there, but we have the right wine out there? Sure. Like these wines, the Pinot Noir, this is only, this is only um, 800 cases that you have of the oh. uh, Signature Series okay. of the J. You know, this is 1,500 cases. Wow. So, you know, these yeah. are still very small volume, but yeah. very um, very particular wines, very unique wines, wines of a place. Absolutely. And I think moving forward, that's going to be the success is focusing on those wines. And we're seeing the thirst for these wines of a place and these wines um, that are um, very expressionable and moving up. Mm -hmm. You know, $20 and above, that is becoming more and more of the norm. Mm -hmm. And when you're, so it's, it's, it's drinking less, but drinking higher, yeah. More yeah. Intri better, yeah, intriguing wines. Yeah. I think that's, that's going to be a big play even more and more in the future. Absolutely. You mentioned, you mentioned the Chardonnay. Chardonnay. I've got, got the, 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 the Gallo Chardonnay, Chardonnay and, and the William, William Hill here. here. And I just wondered oh, yes. if, I want so to we make sure we get those. to those. Yes. 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 So, so which so, one would you like to taste first? You know, I would start with the William Hill. Yeah. Okay. First, which is North Coast. All right. Um, and here, and I'm gonna have to taste through your eyes on the other one. I'll sure. explain why. No worries. So this is the 2016. Okay. okay. All right. Let's get this. There we go. Ah, nice, nice nose. nose. Nice and buttery golden apple. Yeah, it's apples. beautiful. It has a bit of that butter. It has a little bit of the vanilla. The orchard, orchard fruit. It's almost cream brulee. It has yeah. a little bit of it. It's tropical, but it also has a nice apple because yes, you can tell it's going to have some nice acidity on the palate. Mm. Oh, I wish I, I could, could uh, send, send this, this through, through to everybody here. <laughs> Let's get Dried start. apricots, which is lovely. I think it's, mm -hmm. um, mm. it's as very rich. Again, nice and texture. Sweet. At the mm. beginning, but nice acidity where it has yeah. nice length. Good balance. And, yeah. and again, a bit savory. Yeah. yeah. It's very nice. I know. I wish everyone could be okay. tasting with us. That would be well, fun. I'm going, I'm going to, to um, um, well, well, I have I posted all the wines on the, on the, the blog, blog post, but, but I'll also, also post them uh, under here on Facebook. So, so y'all can go back and, and taste along with us because you can watch this on replay. So Excellent. Yeah. So this wine would be fabulous. Paired up with a lot of food. I see this with Asian dishes. I see it with... Asian food, mm -hmm. um, wonderful salmon, a buttery salmon, you know, more oh. of the fatty, yeah. fatty fishes. Ooh, also nice. definitely with like a sole, mm -hmm. um, but with a little bit of butter on the sole. Yeah. Um, All kinds of pairings. Yeah. There. Yeah, absolutely. Chicken would be given as well. Yep. Might not stand up to some, I mean, I would say pork for sure, but probably not some of the red, the red meats. Okay. Even though some whites can. So that would be the North, North Coast, the William Hill. Okay. And then, then you have the signature series, which you're signature. lucky. Yes, I so you have the 2012, right? Now let me see. 20. Uh, I have 2013. 2013. 2013. So yes. we are sold out of that in in, Amer in uh, California. Mm, wow. So this is this is the end of it that you have still in Canada. Okay. So I'll taste you. I'll tell you how it was. It, it's definitely aging, but this will be a definitely more powerful. 
Um, mm. It has a little bit more of the alcohol, so it's going to be much yep. more aromatic on the aromas. Yeah. This is off our Russian River vineyard, which is Laguna. Mm -hmm. And I can tell a, a quick little story about my grandfather, Julio, learning through his garden and his fruit trees. This particular vineyard mm. had uh, Gravenstein apples on it. Oh. And it was a new area that wasn't planted to vineyard. He would pick these apples, and my grandmother would make apple pie down in Modesto in the Central Valley where we grew up. Okay. And this apple pie, he loved. Everyone loved mm. it. He loved it because it had that nice acidity, the brightness. It was very pure to the fruit of the apple, the Gravenstein apple. Had a little bit of nutmeg, a little bit of cinnamon, that spice character. Mm. He finally said, this is going to be an area for Chardonnay. Someday it will be. He felt the best in the world and compete with the best in the world. And today for the estate and this, my, my signature, signature series, I still source from this vineyard because it's so true. It's beautiful. And that's one way he learned through his fruit trees to the wine. Wow. And it's proven itself extremely well. We're using about 60% new French oak here. Mm, so that beautiful. adds with a wonderful spice character as well. And the French oak adds um, elegance. So you have, it's not really big and buttery yeah. and over the top. It still has that elegance and that nice. And when you taste it, you get the nutmeg, the cinnamon, the yeah, spice. Yeah, I do. And you'll get, I do. As you're you'll get the apples. About cooking. Yeah. yeah. As, As you were talking about, about cooking, cooking, your cooking, uh, your mother, grandmother's cooking, cooking is like, oh, my yeah, gosh. The it's, apple it's pie. It's all there. There's spice at the edges. It's so nice. It's like trimmed in spice. But not at the core, it's still very plush with these ripe, juicy apples, which is making my mouth water just talking about it. So enjoy it because I'm all gone. I have no more in the cellar. Well, thank you. I'm already on to the 15. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. goodness. Okay. okay. Well, we've, well, got, we've got, got lots more questions, and I cannot believe it. it. We're, We're like, like nine, nine minutes, minutes away from, from one hour. hour. How fast, fast did that fly by? by? Uh, wow. wow. So, so let's, let's see. see. I just, just want to see if I can capture some, some more questions. questions. Um, let's see, 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 my value wine in college, Rick Del Daris, my value wine in college was Galli, Gallo Hardy Burgundy. All right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, um, Paul, Paul says, says the Gallo, Gallo portfolio wineries, wineries are so, so expensive. expensive. Had a William Hill a couple months ago and really liked it. Melanie, Melanie Lloyd says, says delicious. delicious. Um, Jan, Jan Haver says, says, what a wonderful, wonderful description of that Chardonnay. Chardonnay. I can feel, I feel like, like I, I taste, taste it. it. I know. Oh. Awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's, That's great. Thank you. you have to almost, find the bottle. Almost taste it. Um, all right. So. Oh, there's, oh, there's so, so much, much more. more. I, I didn't get, get through half the questions, questions I had already prepared for you, Gina. So um, let's, let's just, oh, there is, there is one, one more wine we should mention and uh, perhaps, perhaps taste. Oh, that's right. this one, the Louis, Mar Louis, Louis Martini. Martini. So this is. That's a famous name in Napa. Tell us about yes. Louis Martini. What was that, Natalie? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Who was Louis Martini? Tell us a little bit about who he was. So Louis Martini, yep. he was. Um, a dear friend of my grandfather, Julio, okay. an interesting story. In 1933, right after Prohibition, Louis went down to get his license for his winery. Okay. And he just beat by one number. It was, um, what was it? It was 116, and my great uncle Ernest was 117 for a bonded winery, um, the license. Oh, and that's how they met. They were in line, and from ever since then, they've been, they were best friends. He had, well, they've all unfortunately passed away, some of these pioneers. Yeah. But he was a true pioneer, very similar to my grandfather in the land. He believed that great, great wines were made in the vineyard. You had to have the land. And so for him, his heart, he would say, he lived in Napa Valley, but his heart was in Sonoma. Oh. Some of his most famous um, vineyards are in Sonoma and still in Sonoma today. Mm -hmm. The Del Rio Vineyard in the Russian River Valley. And mm -hmm. the, one of the most sought after vineyards is the Monte Rosso. And that's mm -hmm. in Sonoma Valley, the New Moon Mountain. Okay. And um, when we had purchased the Luia Martini Winery, that vineyard came with it. And there's a little bit of that uh, Monte Rosso in here. Mm -hmm. This is the Napa Valley um, Cabernet. Oh. But he was, I would say, he was just a master about where the vineyard should be planted. Um, and he was one of the early starters right after Prohibition. Um, <laughs> wow, it's lovely. This, this could go a very long time in the cellar. cellar. Still, Still. Yes. You know, this will last. It feels like a baby. It feels like a baby. Yeah. Yeah, it's. 2014, 2014 is what I have. So, so I, I, would I would give it. Give it oh. Another few years, at least, if not longer. But it's beautiful. It's it's drinking well. 
uh, but, but still it's drinking well you have a lot of the it's very much the dark fruits yeah, yeah. again yes. savory yeah because this mm -hmm. has a bit of the uh the bay influence which i think uh, some of the great wines definitely have waterways influence whether it be the ocean the bay the russian river right. and i think a lot of that saline character oh, adds to um yeah. that mouthfeel yeah absolutely, absolutely. I, love I love that, that. saline no i'm standing on the ocean there here That's you have great. the wild berries too. They're yes. very tight, kind of those wild berries. If yeah. you were to pick wild berries, I'm probably scared to pick them now. But <laughs> if you knew them in the country and in certain areas here where we live, we yes. definitely do that. They're very tense, um, tight, very focused. Hmm. It's a wine that would, it, it's. I think it's showing extremely well right now. Yes. But when you have a wine like this, especially I feel Cabernet 2014, don't be afraid to pour it into if you don't have a decanter, pour it into anything. Pour it into a, um, you know, how you would a pour water jug. tea, a water jug. Yeah. yeah. Because that air really opens up the fruits. It opens yeah. up the tannins. And it is just so much more pleasing and pleasant. Absolutely. I mean, it reminds me of when you enjoy a bottle of wine with a significant other, good friends. You're loving it right at the end. Mm -hmm. I always wonder, is it because we're at the end of that bottle? <laughs> or because it yeah, had a chance question. to... <laughs> To grow and to breathe. Absolutely. But you could never hurt a Cabernet by giving it a bit of air. No, that's true. Especially wine is the young ones. Exactly. Young wine ones. is very resilient. More, more resilient, more resilient than, than we think. We kind of call yes. it sometimes. But I'll, I'll do, do like, like double, double or triple, triple decanting, decanting from, from like, like one jug to another and back again, again just, just to like really air it out. Open it. And it helps tannins tremendously. Yes. The tannin. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's why we want to go back and have another sip. It's because it's texturally good. It's not about the flavors always. It's about how it feels in our mouth. Yeah, texture. texture. There's, There's been, been a lot, a lot of, of texture, texture here tonight in the conversation, the conversation and the wine, wine Gina. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. I, I could I talk all night. night. We need to do this again, really. This Definitely. I loved it. It was such wonderful. a great experience. Awesome. awesome. Good. Good. Well, <laughs> you did great. Um, I'm going to wrap up now only because we are almost at the hour, and uh, but this was wonderful. Where can people find you and your wines online? What's the best place for them to go find you or the wines and or the wines? Yes, so I would say the website, definitely. We have okay. Contact Us on our website. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure I get it right, but it's pretty much www.signature uh, series. Okay. Um, I should know this by heart. <laughs> That's probably because you don't right? have to look it up often. often. <laughs> I'm, sure I'm sure if anybody, anybody does a search on Gallo, Gallo Signature, Signature series, series, it's going to pop, pop right up. up. Exactly. So it's yeah. our website, the Gallo Signature Series, um, dot com. And it has contact us, and I'll I answer any you know anything that comes that way. I'd be happy to answer any more questions, give you any feedback on the, the family, or um, some of our different vineyards that Rebecca has been so nice to put in the background for you, Natalie. So Absolutely. thank you, Rebecca, for doing that. Yes, thank you. Rebecca. Um, <laughs> and we love we love to hear feedback, okay. good, bad, or the ugly, as we always say. <laughs> we always can learn too. So that's any, great. Any, any, any questions you have or uh, thoughts you want to give me, please, please go to our website. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, Gina. All right. All right. So, so folks, folks, stay online because I'm, I'm announcing, announcing the winner and some, some other announcements. But, but Gina, Gina, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for spending your time with us this evening. We really enjoyed it. Everybody had a lot of fun. The comments are still coming in. Thank you so much. And uh, I wish you all the best in everything that you're doing, life, personal, and wine. Thank you, Natalie. I wish you all the best, too. And all the listeners, same as well. And thank you. It was a great experience. Good. All right. Take care. Ciao, ciao. Okay. Bye-bye, Gina. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Stay with me. And uh, we will um, do some announcements and everything. Oh, getting lots of hearts on Facebook. So I am just, uh, wow, this has been wonderful, Carrie Fox. Lori Demings, thank you from the bottom of my wine glass. Gina, come back again soon. That is so nice, guys. Katie Emmett joined. John Kant joined. John Ventra joined. Wow. Um, and folks, if you we didn't get your questions, still post them below because um, I'm going to ask Gina to jump back in. She wants the feedback. Um, and after this session's over, as you know, uh, our guests will um, come back and still post and answer uh, what we didn't get to. Um, so take a moment, if you love this conversation as much as I did, take a moment to share with your friends who love wine. Tell them why you enjoyed this conversation because they can watch the replay, even though we're coming up to the end. And by the way, if you're watching the replay right now in the future, <laughs> you can still share it. 
let more people know about this great conversation we had. Uh, I will be announcing the winner soon. I will be telling you who next week's guest is. It's going to be fabulous. And also take a moment to what was the most interesting point that you learned tonight? Just briefly, what did you find the most interesting? All right. So let me just go. I know Darren. Darren just says, I cannot believe it's been an hour. Did that not fly by? Holy smokes. Marie-Pierre Belittle is here. Hello, Marie-Pierre. Stephen Andrews, thank you, Gina and Natalie, for a most enjoyable program. Very entertaining. Thank you, Gina Suzanne. Laurie Demings gives two hearts. And Alan Cameron says, just awesome. You guys are just awesome. Thank you for spending your time with us. Okay, now I would like to announce the winner from last week's contest, which was uh, with Kevin Bagos, the detective wine mystery, tasting wine past, uh, and so on. He's a really bright guy, MIT night journalism fellow. You're gonna love the book. And here is the winner. There you go. It is Beverly Aslason. Oh, I need to remember how to pronounce your name, Beverly. You're in California. I know that. Congratulations, Beverly. Aslason. Am I Aslason? Ah, I need to have a, a guide with me. Anyway, thank you so much for your share of our conversation next week. Folks, if you're sharing this, uh, this uh, video, Next week, I'm going to be announcing the winner of a unopened <laughs> Gallo Signature Series Pinot Noir. It is $60. It's not available in Canada. Uh, and um, you can win it. All right. Okay, so next week's guest, next week's guest is going to be John Schreiner. I consider him the godfather of Canadian wine writers. He's had 40 decades, 40 decades, four decades of wine writing. We're going to talk about BC's iconic, most iconic wines. He's produced or written a book that's just come out with the 99 wines you need to try in BC before you kick the bucket with a spittoon. Okay, so guys, thank you so much. And I'm going to sign off now. This has been absolutely wonderful. And I hope to see you next week, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern. That's Toronto, New York time. And I hope something is good in your glass tonight. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.